like all superhero movies these days, The Suicide Squad is packed full of hidden details, nods to the source material, and tiny easter eggs that you may have missed the first time around. And that includes the costumes. In this video, we'll take a look at the squad's costumes and character design and give you some fun facts and tidbits that you might not have known. Let's go! Let's start off with Idris Elba's Bloodsport, because that man is so charming. He managed to make one of DC's more obscure villains one of the best in the DCEU. Bloodsport and his relationship with Asshat Peacemaker is one of the best parts of the movie, and the two are constantly trying to one-up each other, particularly in the scene where they wipe out the Corto Maltese guerrilla army. In that scene, and in the final battle with Starro, we see Bloodsport use a vast array of weapons, but we did not actually get to see his full range. That's because his suit has 14 secret weapons. Oh yeah, 14 weapons, Jeremy, 14. That's insane. As revealed on Twitter by director James Gunn, Bloodsport's suit has 14 hidden weapons, including a two-piece rifle, a flail, line spike, sword, slingshot, and a whole arsenal of pistols. Also, just for good measure, his skull helmet is also bulletproof. In the tweet that showed concept art for Bloodsport's suit, Gunn unsurprisingly said that the outfit was the hardest he had ever worked on by far, and said that the script, props, and costume departments all had to work closely together to accomplish the finished product. In an interview, costume designer Judiana Makovsky said, quote, It was the production designer, myself, and our concept illustrators all in the same room with James Gunn for six to eight weeks alone just figuring out what the movie was. You don't normally work that way on films, especially with these big comic book movies. James just creates that atmosphere of absolute collaboration. End quote. While they do have a short flashback to her classic Jester costume in the movie, the 2016 Suicide Squad opted to go with the super short shorts and the Daddy's Little Monster tee, which isn't particularly faithful to the comic book design. However, Gunn opted to go for a more conventional Harley Quinn look for his movie, bringing back her typical red and black outfit, saying that he wanted more of a battle outfit. She knows she's going on a mission, so she's not going to go in in little shorts. He also wanted to go back to the source material, with her beach outfit actually being inspired by her costume in the Injustice 2 video game. Gunn was initially going to imitate a similar hairstyle to the one worn by Harley in Ayer's film, but again, decided to change this and eventually go with the red and black look. Gunn also workshopped a number of slogans to appear on the back of her jacket before narrowing it down to three, with two of the finalists being Clown AF and World's Greatest Grandpa before finally settling on Live Fast, Die Clown. Superhero suits are known for being ridiculously uncomfortable, but that wasn't the case for John Cena's Peacemaker, who actually found it to be really comfortable, so much so that he barely took it off. When asked why Cena seemingly doesn't take the outfit off, seeing as how he's also rocked it in interviews and on red carpets, Gunn said that he loves it, and it's comfy. In fact, Cena took a little nap in the outfit, which Gunn jokingly said served as the inspiration for the upcoming Peacemaker series. However, the outfit did come with somewhat of a practical issue, in particular the shiny toilet seat that he wears on his head. Shiny metal objects can be somewhat of a nightmare when filming, because you know the light from the blue or the green screen can then be reflected on the surface. Actually, in movies they call that a spill, and it's part of the reason The Mandalorian opted to go with their interactive volume set instead of green screens. While The Suicide Squad did have practical set builds, many scenes were still filmed in front of the blue screen, so this caused issues as Gunn wanted the helmet in as many scenes as possible, and Cena would barely take it off. Gunn said in a tweet that, quote, Peacemaker's helmet is a damn mirror ball, and we need to remove me and the crew from every single shot in which we use it, in the movie and in the show. We shoot a full wraparound plate of every set, most of which are fortunately practical to put in the helmet that we needed, end quote. Now that is dedication to the toilet seat. Like Harley Quinn, Rick Flagg's outfit was also much more comic book accurate, with him rocking his typical yellow shirt, although it admittedly had a little bit more to it, with Gunn providing the rabbit doodle seen on the chest. However, some theorists suggest that the rabbit in question has some hidden meanings. Firstly, the red cape could be a reference to one of DC's biggest heroes, huh? Superman? A character that Gunn was initially offered to do a movie for before he settled on Suicide Squad. 
Secondly, the Spanish words in the text bubble, which in English translate as obstacles are opportunities, could be a nod to Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy firing, which freed him up to take on this movie before being rehired for Volume 3. And also, lastly, some have suggested that the rabbit could be a nod to one of Warner Brothers' most famous faces, Bugs Bunny. But that one might be a bit of a stretch. King Shark is literally my favorite character from the movie, and part of the reason for this is that instead of rocking hard abs, he rocks an awesome dad bod. Gunn was insistent on this from the very beginning, saying, quote, I didn't think that King Shark would have such a mammalian body structure, end quote. But one thing that was not clear in Gunn's mind was what kind of shark he would be. King Shark has been both a great white and a hammerhead in the comics, and Gunn did actually test the character as a hammerhead in this movie, but found that it didn't work in the practical sense, saying, quote, having eyes on the sides far apart made it incredibly awkward shooting interactions with other people. You couldn't really see him looking at the other person, and the shots tended to be too wide, end quote. Could be kind of confusing in a good way. So, of course, they decided to go with the great white design, and to be honest, I think he's perfect just the way he is. King Shark may be CG, but David Desmolchin's face when he's afflicted by the interdimensional disease was actually prosthetics, with his design actually being based on Boris Karloff's Frankenstein's monster and Lon Chaney's Wolfman. The practical facial prosthetics fitted with working pulsating lights was created by Legacy and Gunn was quick to show off just how good they were in a number of behind the scenes images. The prosthetics were so good, Dastamulchin actually became emotional as he realized that he was the modern embodiment of the characters that inspired the design. Ratcatcher 2 was the surprising heart of the movie and served as the real emotional core in amongst a sea of craziness. But not only was she the movie's emotional connection, but she was also a badass in her own right. And not only made it out of the movie alive, but was really the major player when it came down to taking down Starro. As you know, her main ability is communicating with rats through the use of her rat communicator, which she inherited from her father. But her mask actually has a secret ability that you might not have known. Her mask actually comes fitted with a filtration system, which prevents her from breathing in horrendous smells and fumes when she's down in the sewers with her rats. TDK was just useless and ridiculous enough to make us want to see more, and seeing as his screen doesn't actually go red in the movie, and Gunn said that one character made it out alive without us knowing, my bet is that we may see TDK and his detachable limbs somewhere down the line. If we do get to see TDK again, we may actually get to see him detach his legs as well as his arms. In a behind the scenes video released by Gunn, TDK actor Nathan Fillion can be seen dancing while wearing blue stockings on both his arms and his legs. That my friend suggests that all his limbs are in fact detachable. In a follow up tweet, Gunn said that quote, he would be a real if he called himself the detachable kid and only had detachable arms. I didn't pick the damn team. Let's hope we see more of TDK sometime soon. Mm hmm. And finally, Weasel is probably the kookiest and weirdest looking character in the movie. His design was actually based on a pretty familiar character. Part of his inspiration was actually Bill the Cat from the Bloom County comic strip and now I cannot unsee it. 